Hi, welcome to the noise path. In this episode, we're going to try and see if we can repair this key site E36313A, which is a triple programmable power supply. It can do 6 volts at 10 amps and 225 volts at 2 amps. So there's a lot of power coming out from this. And of course, these are all fully independent and isolated power supply ports, which is very helpful in various isolated situations. It does have a USB port in the front, and this is part of the new series of uh, power supplies that Keysight makes. It replaces essentially those classic VFT display ones, which have been an industry standard for a very long time. This one has a GUI interface and so on. It's not a touch screen, but it does have you know, nicer GUIs, and you can do all kind of stepping and programming different voltages. It's, it's very nice. And this one looks almost brand new. It does not turn on. It doesn't even have the standby light come on when you plug it in. And it does have a bit of a burnt smell coming from it. So something has gone catastrophically wrong inside. Hopefully it's not a really bad problem, but indeed we should start from there and figure out if we see anything visually wrong with it. So let's take it apart and take a look inside. So I started this assembly process. I don't see immediately anything wrong here, but I like the way this is put together. So we have this top board which handles all of the power supply functions itself. We take a look at it and all the even the Ethernet, USB and all the other connections are here in the back. And it does have this connector in the front which plugs into the front computer. All the computation, the GUI, everything is actually handled on this. There, are, there is really no digital processing on this interface at all, which is quite interesting too. You can see the separation clearly here and it goes all the way around and hugs all the human interface parts of this because this has the human interface from the front panel this is all the ones in the back so clearly the center is fully isolated it's a nice engineering design to be expected from Keysight now inside the unit we have an absolutely massive transformer as to be expected also and some more power supply stuff here I can smell that burning uh, feeling in here somewhere we have to take a closer look at it but it's a nice design a lot of cables going around again typical from this kind of power supply a lot of nice grounding they have they've taken a care of some good protection circuit down there which we will also take a look at too and here's the front end computer right there you can see there is an ARM processor right there in the middle and this is very classic this is how basically pretty much every instrument is done these ways where the front end computer it just handles everything and it controls the GUI is one piece and this can be used for many many classes of instruments you just have to change the front label and that's it and the rest is is handled by the unique function of this particular instrument so let me look around a little bit more see if we can identify anything that is causing this burning smell and here is the other power supply board over here and we can see that we do have an output here which is accessible from the back and I think it's only one of the outputs and that certainly means that part of the power supply has to be here but the main line coming over here and there is some room for some common mode inductors that are not populated or common mode transformer I wonder why that is not there they, instead they have zero ohm resistors in this place to basically short them out or go right across them some capacitors of course and then there are big, cap big capacitors on the other side which are 16 volts 33,000 microfarads now if I look at this I still don't really see anything wrong with it now on the other side we do have some more components again expect that this is part of the power supply remember this is not a switching power supply so all we're going to have is linear regulation done through these transistors which are on these heat sinks same as the other one and another thing to note are these shunt resistors here for measuring current, which is necessary in a power supply like this. And you can see the little cutouts in the corners for where the sense ports are. So the current will flow over there and the voltage will be picked up over there. And there's a lot of reasons for why they do that. There should be a good video about that as well at some point. So looking around a little bit there more, I think I have found the problem. It's right there. There it is. Oop. There we go that is the issue it's focusing on the wrong component but you get the idea so let me take that out and see what's going on with it this is definitely a diode it's marked under the dual diode perhaps and it goes into this terminal which that terminal itself goes to the transformer actually one of the some of the turns of the transformer so it's in line with that i still don't know why it has popped i don't know what has gone wrong with it but nonetheless it has to come out and here's a data sheet of the broken Schottky diode pair that is in this power supply. Now normally you can find Schottky diodes in essentially any power supply because they're used as rectifiers and in DC DC converters for many reasons. But this one is a fairly modern one. You can see it does have a forward bias voltage of 0.43 volts at a continuous current of 5 amps, which is pretty impressive. And even though I find a lot of Schottky diodes in my bins of parts, none of them could come even close to this. Now I did find this on eBay somewhere, so we're going to have to do a quick measurement just to make sure the part is authentic and verify that it does indeed have this very low forward bias voltage at such a high current. But the reason this is important is because it essentially directly dictates what the power consumption inside of this diode pair would be. Because the higher the forward bias voltage is across these diodes, when you pass current through it, the higher dissipation of these diodes. So therefore it will have a higher thermal strain on it. 
Now in this case it does have a big heat sink, but because this is a modern power supply, I wanted to make sure that I put exactly the same part in, just so that everything looks very good. Now I've already received this, so let's go ahead and take a quick measurement on it before we put it back into the instrument. So here I've connected the component directly to the source meter, there it is, and we're making a four wire measurement. We're going to do a very basic sweep, I've actually done it once already, I'm going to do it again, and this is going to sweep from 250 milliamp all the way to 6 amps, and we're going to be able to measure the forward bias voltage of one of the two diodes that are in there. We just press trigger, it's going to run it again, it's going to look exactly the same. This is a brief measurement, so we don't really need a heat sink, although it does get heated up just a little bit. And if you look over here, this is the x-axis, at the bottom, that's actually the amount of current we're pushing in. And the y-axis over here is the measured forward bias voltage. So right around here is 5 amps. If you go over there, you see five, about 500 millivolt is the forward bias, which is close enough. There are some inaccuracies and temperatures, things to consider, and this is only one of the two diodes. And you could parallel them and you could get even less in that case. So I think this looks good, gives me enough confidence to install it in the power supply. And here's our Schottky diode pair already installed on the heatsink with thermal material. Let's see how it performs. Alright, here we go, it's all put back together, and I'm going to bring the voltage up slowly using my programmable AC-DC source here to make sure that it, it doesn't have any other issues. So we're at 10 volts right now, we see nothing. 20 volts is consuming half a watt. 30 volts, now 1.5 watt. Now it's burning 2 watts, 5 watts at 50 volts. 60 volts, oh, something switched. 8 watts. Okay, so far so good, I felt the fan turn on. There we go, we're at 120 volts and it is consuming 13 watts in standby, which is actually quite a lot. Let's go ahead and turn it on. All right, look at that. That looks good so far. It's booting, indeed, and there it is. Okay, good. Now, of course, we have to test it, but it certainly does these things that it's supposed to. It does enable and disable the outputs. Well, the only one thing to do, connect it to a programmable load and see if it's actually doing what it's supposed to. So let's do a couple of really quick tests to make sure the power supply is actually functional. So I have channel 1 here set to 5 volts and maximum current is 10 amps. So I kept that turning it on and you can see on the right side that we do have indeed 5 volts coming out of it. I'm going to enable the constant current. We're drawing 5 amps from it without any issues. It seems to be working just fine. And we can go ahead and change the constant current to 10, which is the maximum this power supply is supposed to do. And indeed, it does no problem. This is 50 watts coming from the power supply, of course. And the, the drop that you see is in this cable, because I'm not doing a four-wire measurement. So it looks good. Great, so let's go ahead and disable that. Let's put the constant current on 2 amps now, which is a maximum of the other channels. We can move this to channel 2, which is set to 10 volts. Turn it on. There it is. That's our 10 volts. We can enable that, drawing 2 amps from it. That is 20 watts right now, and it also seems to have no issue doing that, and it's reporting the correct values as well. That looks good. Disable that, and of course going to the final channel, which is exactly the same. And these are independent power supplies, so you can make a negative supply if you want to. You can turn this off and turn this one back on. Here's 10 volts. Turn that on, and there's 2 amps there. And we can of course turn all of them on. Wouldn't matter, doesn't make any difference. So I think it works. It's most likely that diode must have had some factory problems from the component itself and slowly failed, eventually just popped and caused this issue. Now these things do represent a large inductive load. So sometimes if you plug them in and out of some, maybe not such a good source, it could have caused some inrush problem. Its fuse was in fact dead also. So there were two things at the same time. And so there you have it, a really quick video repairing this. I have a bunch of other things I'm working on. So let me know in the comment section what you think about this and I'll see you next time.